Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here to talk to you about logistic growth, which is a type of exponential growth, but we have some sort of a limit on how far we can grow. So how we write that a population growth is based on, first of all, a rate, also based on the size of population that you have currently, and then also on the growth slowing as we reach some sort of a limiting value, what we call a carrying capacity, a value that we can't go beyond as we grow, then we write that population growth, logistic growth, as this equation here. We have dp dt equals r times parentheses with k minus p over k, times p, so let's break this down for you. First of all, dp dt on the left side, that's just going to be the change in population. So that's the instantaneous change in population equal to a bunch of stuff on the right side. So our r is going to be our rate of growth. So depending on the circumstance, we might have a different rate there. Our p on the far right side there is just our current population as it stands at that point in time. And then this last piece here in parentheses is k minus p over k. We know the p part is the current population, but this k is just some constant. It's called the carrying capacity, okay? That is this amount that we can't grow beyond, right? So if you have, you know, you're on a planet and it could not support life more than such and such million or billion people, that's your carrying capacity. If you have wildlife that live out in some sort of area in nature and there's only enough food to support such and such population for the wildlife, then that max population will be its carrying capacity. We'll go ahead and make a note that this entire expression in parentheses here, this k minus p over k, this is the percent of carrying capacity left that we still haven't reached yet with our current population. Let's go ahead and work this as a separable equation. So we have dp dt, we can see we need to get all the p's on one side, all the t's on the other. There aren't many t's to get on the other side, it turns out, I think, right? So the first thing let's do is we'll go ahead and move the dt to the other side. We'll multiply that to the other side and we'll get dt over there. And now we'll really need to get all of the p expression on the side that has dp. The r I could move or not, I'll probably just go ahead and leave it here. Let's deal with the p here. So if I divide both sides by p, then that will put over p on this side, and that will reduce that. I don't really want to break this k minus p over k apart and move it, so I'm just going to go ahead and multiply by its reciprocal on both sides, and we'll get that over there to the left. So that would give us k over k minus p, and I actually already have a p in the denominator over here, so I'm going to go ahead and write that as well. So I get k over p times k minus p, and we have dp over there. And then the only thing we have left on the right side, really, once we've moved that over, is just r dt. So we have equals r dt. And now we would go ahead and integrate this with respect to p and integrate this with respect to t. This is a super easy integral over here. This one's not so bad. But what we might need to do is think about creating some partial fractions to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and break this up before I write my integral. So I'm going to go ahead and think of k over p times k minus p. So we're going to break it up into separate fractions over these factors. So I'm going to say something over p plus something else over k minus p, right? If you remember the partial fraction method. Okay, if we get a common denominator, then my numerators would be k on the left side. This a, I would multiply in k minus p. That's what's missing underneath a in this fraction. And then to get a common denominator, I would multiply in a p to the b fraction. So I would get b times p. And remember, we would only solve the numerators, so I'm just going to focus on what we would get from the numerators there. Now think about how we'll do this. We need to solve for a and b, and the best way to do that, I think, is just plug in values for p that will reduce these factors to zero. So think about, I could get rid of this factor of p here just by letting p equal zero. Let's do that. So we'll say p equals zero. That would give us k is equal to a times k minus zero plus b times zero, right? So that would give us k equals a times k. In other words, a would need to be one here. And then how could I make this other factor zero, maybe to solve for b? Uh, well, I could plug in k for p, right? So let's try when p is k, what do we get? I would get k equals a 
times k minus k, right? So that would be zero there, plus b times, if p is k, then this becomes b times k. So we get k is equal to nothing here, b times k. So b must be one in this case, right? So we get a is one and b is one. And I can go ahead and put those in there and set up my integral now for this left-hand side. Let's go ahead and start back up here. So I'll say the integral of this, but I'm going to write it as my partial fractions instead. So now it's going to be one over p plus one over k minus p. And we're integrating dp treating p as the variable of integration over here integral of r dt that one's easier isn't it all right let's look at these these are actually both log rules so integral dp over p is going to be ln of absolute value of p uh, plus, and now be careful here, if you do u substitution, I'm not going to work out the details all the way, but if you let u equal k minus p and then you do du, you actually get negative dp. So we're actually going to get a minus log rule here. We'll get minus ln of k minus p equals, if I integrate r dt, remember r is just some constant if I'm integrating dt, so that's r times t then. And I'll go ahead and put my c over here. So there's my constant of integration. Let's do some solving for p now. A little bit of work. So let's go ahead and use properties of logs and combine these. So this would be ln of absolute value. When you have subtract between logs, it becomes divide when you put it in the same log. So that would become p over k minus p is equal to r t plus c. Now I'll need to get rid of my ln on the outside here, so take the exponential of both sides, so e to the power of that side, e to the power of that side. e to the ln of something is just that something, right? So we get absolute value of p over k minus p is equal to, all of this is now in an exponent, right? This is e to the rt plus c. Let's use properties of exponents here to break this up into two exponentials. So we'll go ahead and say absolute value of p over k minus p is equal to e to the rt times e to the c, right? Now this last piece here, what is e to some constant? Well, that's just going to be a constant still, right? So I'm going to drop my absolute value brackets and explain why in a second equal to, this is just some constant, I'll put it out front, we'll say c e to the rt. Now I've dropped my absolute value brackets because I'm going to say that I could let c be positive or negative, doesn't really matter, so we won't worry so much about the absolute value. So now I have p over k minus p equals this c times the exponential here. Let's give ourselves some more room. So now if I, let's go ahead and multiply this, actually this denominator to the other side. So let's say p is equal to c e to the r t times the quantity k minus p. And the way we'll solve this for p is actually to distribute and then regather our p. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll say p is equal to, uh, let's call it k c e to the r t minus p c e to the r t. And then from here, let's go ahead and get our p terms on one side. So I'll move this term over, add it to the other side. That would become p plus pc e to the rt equals kc e to the rt. We're getting tongue twister-ish here. And now to solve for p, I can factor out my p. So it'll be p times the quantity 1 plus c e to the rt equals k c e to the r t. And now I can just divide by this in parentheses on both sides. So we'll get p is equal to k c e to the r t all over 1 plus c e to the r t. Now we can leave it this way. It's solved for c, but I'm going to go ahead and make one more adjustment to this so that it looks more like we see it normally. I'm going to go ahead and take each term in my expression here, and I'm going to divide by c e to the r t. Okay, so if I take this and divide each of these three things by c e 
to the RT, then that's going to give us P is equal to just K on the top, right? If I divide that by CE to the RT, so we'll get K over. Now, if I divide this one by CE to the RT, then that becomes one. I'm gonna write that in front. Plus, if I divide this by CE to the RT, I get some other constant, one over C, but that's still just some constant, right? And then if I'm dividing by an e to the rt, think about that really means I'm going to get e to the negative rt, right? So this would become some constant times e to the negative rt. And this is more likely the common way that you will see the equation for exponential growth with our carrying capacity on the top. And you'll notice that our r is still our rate. And the constant here, whatever constant we have, can also affect the logistic growth as well. Okay, hopefully this provides you more insight into logistic growth as a differential equation and some practice at separable equations. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in the next video.